welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Hall, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Yeah, I'm Wayne Hall. I'm uh, Amira's professor. That is, I've retired a couple of years ago, and I've worked in the sort of area of the patterns of drug use and harms related to drug use for, I guess, nearly 40 years. And a, a particular focus during that time has been around cannabis uh, and the effects of cannabis on uh, the health of users and also more recently the potential medical benefits of cannabis. Now, when we talk about the health of users when it comes to cannabis, are you more concerned? Obviously, there's a lot of talk about the positive benefits um, with treatment for things of that sort. Are you concerned with both sides, the positive and the negative? The negative doesn't necessarily get talked about a whole lot. No, I mean, I think we've we've done a complete switch for a large part of the time that I've worked in the field. Uh, we've largely heard about the downside of cannabis use, the, the adverse effects that some people can experience. And I think probably for the last 10 to 15 years, we've largely heard about the benefits, the manifold benefits of cannabis, and and also a lot of skepticism about the harms, largely by people who've been arguing for the legalisation of adult use. So I think one of the casualties of the, the debate and, and legalisation has been uh, a sort of a lost side of the, the fact that cannabis, as with all drugs, has a downside. There are some adverse effects that, that people experience. Now, we talked. To, you talked about the negative in the beginning. Was that when you first started looking into this? It was like around the time, I'm not going to date you here, but is reefer madness kind of the whole, you know, the whole, the craze of marijuana and this bad kind of stigma that went with it? Yeah, and now... I'm not, not, it's not quite that old. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I first got interested in this in the well, in a professional sense, in the 1990s, when I was asked to review the adverse health effects of cannabis for a government inquiry here in Australia, because there was thought given at that time as to whether we should uh, reduce the criminal penalties for personal possession and use uh, for cannabis. Uh, and I, I went on to advise the WHO on that as well throughout the 90s and into the 2000s. Since then, I've, I've become involved directly in doing research on cannabis uh, and some of its adverse effects, particularly dependence. I think one of the underappreciated risks of cannabis is that people can develop dependence on it. And that's not surprising. I mean, people become dependent on tobacco, on alcohol, on a variety of other drugs. And the same is true for cannabis, particularly people who get into a habit of using it daily and, and using it to you know, uh, deal with things like problems with sleep or anxiety or depression and what have you. Uh, they're, they're quite likely or at greater risk of developing a, a pattern of daily use that they then find difficult to stop when if they decide that they want to stop. Is it because of the stimulant feeling that they get from it, much like any other substance use? Well, I think it's for most people, it's the, you know, it makes them feel relaxed. It makes them high as in military language. They feel good um, and it helps them to socialize with friends, particularly other people who are using cannabis. And it's often something that's done in uh, as an accompaniment to other things that people enjoy, like eating meals or going to movies or concerts or what have you. So there are all sorts of positive things about it um, and its effects. And so if people are doing that not very frequently, uh, you know, they're probably not at high, most most people that is are probably not at high risk of harm. But if they get into the habit that this is becomes a daily occurrence or near daily occurrence, then they're putting themselves at risk of uh, developing dependence on the drug. Have you spoken to anybody that's had some of that experience with full-on dependence that they recognize that there might be some adverse effects or might have a different perspective on cannabis since maybe when they started? Yeah, we, we interviewed uh, a large number of people back in the late 1990s in Sydney, and these were people who were uh, heavy daily users, and quite a lot of them were, were sort of wondering whether their use had gotten beyond their control and whether they needed to do something to stop. And of course, large numbers of people do present to treatment services asking for help to quit because they've tried to stop and have failed, as happens with, with alcohol and, uh, and with tobacco. So it's it's not uncommon and it's not simply due to the fact that cannabis was illegal because the Netherlands, which effectively decriminalised cannabis back in the mid-1970s, cannabis is the most common drug that takes people into treatment in the Netherlands as well. Uh, is people presenting saying, I need help to stop using cannabis. 
Well, why only in the 10 or 15 years has there only been talk about the positives? And it seems like if you even suggest any negatives, people look at you who might be on the side of legalization, which I'm in support of it being legalized. I just want the conversation to have both sides to it. But they'll look at you like you're a, I don't know, a square. I'm, I would say square because that's just, I don't know. They look at you like you're bland or you don't, you know, you don't like to have fun or something like that. I'm like, well, that's not really what it is. It's just that nobody's really talking about the potency of some of these things as well. Too. I mean, you can walk in a store and get a 1500 milligram cake pop. And I'm like, oh my God, I couldn't imagine being like a 15 or 16 year old kid and somehow getting that in your hands and taking that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's been one of the, the big surprises of legalization because one of the common arguments for legalization is that it would permit cannabis to be better regulated and that we could regulate potency. Because one of the big arguments had, had often been that uh, increase in potency in cannabis before legalization was caused by the fact that it was uh, prohibited. But of course, since legalization, we've seen huge increases in the THC content of a lot of cannabis products that are sold. And we now see the, the production of these waxes and shatters and extracts that are, are very, very potent. Nothing like what uh, was around when, when cannabis was being used when I was at college in the uh, mid to late 70s in, in Australia when there was plenty of cannabis use around. Now, with the potency and the amount of cannabis products, how many, I mean, from your, I guess, estimate, what would you say how many cannabis products are out there? Well, it's it's been a, a huge explosion. I mean, you, you've, when you legalize the production and uh, and and sale of these products, then you allow an industry to develop, to experiment, uh, and to compete with other suppliers. And one of the ways they compete is by offering consumers a wider variety of, of products. So you've got things like gummies and candies and chocolates. Uh, the alcohol industry has gotten into producing beers with uh, THC and CBD uh, in them, and and you've had the industry itself producing cannabis oils uh, for vaping. And uh, and more recently, uh, sort of supercharging uh, herbal cannabis by adding THC to pre-roll joints, for example. So we've seen that as a consequence. There's no surprise because the the marketers, the best customers for uh, legal cannabis suppliers are people who use daily, and they typically tend to be much more tolerant to the effects of THC. So they like more potent products. They probably account for eighty to eighty-five percent of all cannabis that's consumed. So if you're in the business of selling and making a profit from cannabis, they're the, the market you target. So there's no surprises, I think, to see uh, these more potent products being marketed. And a lot of the other products, particularly the edibles and the uh, infusions and so on, uh, are really aimed at people who are not keen on smoking, who want a safer method of delivery, and probably older people, because it's been being marketed as a health and wellness product, as well as a, a drug that you use for its uh, desired sort of psychoactive effects. Well, even with the products, it's in soap now, and I didn't know that. And you have to actually really examine your materials before you start using stuff like that. But what are your thoughts on the commercialization of it? Obviously, there's corporations, dispensaries, and things of that sort that sell it. But also, there's some mom and pops that grow their own and are able to sell in some places. So it brings up a bigger sense of confusion of where you're getting your product from, and at the same time, the differences in the product as well, too. Yeah, I think when people, you know, argued for legalization, I thought they thought, I think many of them imagined that we'd see a market where it was basically mom and pop producers, you know, not large scale production, uh, people producing sort of artisanal cannabis, a bit like, you know, sort of uh, brewers, um, micro brewers and so on. But of course, you know, you, when there's money to be made, then there's large corporations will see an opportunity. And at the moment, that's constrained in the US because uh, cannabis is still illegal federally. So a lot of these companies can't invest, whereas they can in Canada. And it's clear in Canada that the alcohol and tobacco industry and the uh, beverage industry and the finance industry are all piling into the, the cannabis industry. And, and of course, they'll go for large scale production uh, and maximizing profit and extracting the, the maximum that they can from cannabis plants. And, and that will mean often using the whole cannabis plant and extracting all the THC, and then they've got to find a use of the THC. Uh, 
So there are those sorts of consequences, I think, of commercialization that people, some people didn't see coming, but I think were, were fairly predictable. It's what we've seen with gambling and with a lot of other so-called vices, you know, when we legalize them and, and allow the free market pretty free reign, and they get out there in all sorts of inventive ways of promoting their product and particularly promoting the regular heavy use of their product because that's where they make their money. Was there always, I mean, in your perspective, was there always this need for cannabis, a consumption of cannabis, a wantingness for cannabis? Or do you think that was because they kind of repressed it for a very long time? And now you see this whole complete 180 shift where now it seems like I'm, I have an uncle that I've known since I was basically born that has had a red flannel with burn holes in it. And that's all he's ever, I've been smoking, you know, for however many years, but I know that's not the general public, but now I'm seeing seems like everywhere I walk now, I'm coming across like three or four people that are just smoking a joint on the street or doing something, whether they got their medical card. So I'm just wondering if that consumption at once was always there or did it just spark up? Look, I think it has gone up. I mean, the, sur the survey suggests that it has gone up. Uh, it gone up in a variety of ways. One has been a lot older, a lot more older people coming back to cannabis use. Some of those would be my vintage. You would have grown up with it as college students, as young adults. Who probably stopped using it because it was not a very respectable thing to do. It's now promoted as a medicine and as a well-being product, and and so people are prepared to use it. Often, you know, products that don't involve smoking or vaping, so they might take edibles and and drinks and so on. Uh, I think the the clearest impact of legalization has been an increase in the, the proportion of cannabis users who are regular users, and that's no surprise. You make a there's a commodity that people are using, which is pretty expensive and uh, stigmatized and illegal. You make it legal, you destigmatize it, you make it cheaper, more potent, and you're going to see a lot more people using it. And if you've got a lot of, you know, you know, sort of media out there sort of saying there's nothing to worry about here, there's no downside to cannabis, it's, it's all upside, then it's not surprising you see a lot more uptake. So I agree with you, the comments you made in the introduction that one of the things we need to do a better job of post-legalization is better education of people, of the of cannabis users about the downsides, the particular patterns of cannabis use, and the risks for people with particular, uh, you know, sort of backgrounds who've got a history of personal uh, mental illness or mental health problems, then you'd probably be wise to be very cautious about getting involved in cannabis, certainly in a regular way, for example. Uh, and and also people with certain medical conditions which might be worsened by particularly uh, vaping or smoking cannabis. So I think there's there's plenty of scope for better education about the the potential downsides as well as the the upsides, which is what we're largely hearing about in the media most of the time. Well, where would you implement proper education? Would you expect the dispensary or the shop to do that, or which I because I I, see, I hear kids talking about it in school which is like middle school. Now, nah, man, I sound like my parents saying that. But no, like I hear them talk about it in middle school and elementary school. Like I have little nephews that are going into elementary school. So that's where my concern comes in. Did we do it? We had the D.A.R.E. program. It didn't work out too well, but they at least try to tell you about drugs a little bit and put a Surgeon General's warning on the thing of joints or something like that. Would I mean, that's it's small stuff, but that's small education and just giving people the understanding that this is not 100% pain-free consumption here. This could affect you either in short term or long term. Yeah, I've got, I mean, I think the Canadians have they've probably got a, they've done a better job of that because they legalized nationally there, and so they were able to have more consistent approach to labeling and, and packaging of, of cannabis products. So they don't allow brand names, for example, they go in for plain packaging like as with cigarettes. They have health warnings and so on. Uh, so I think that's certainly a bare minimum that we should be doing. Uh, the trickier thing is is school-based education. That's always been the problem, whether it's alcohol and tobacco, which are technically illegal for people under the legal uh, purchase age in, in in all countries. But now we've got cannabis added to the mix. What We, we should be saying something about cannabis as well uh, in, in the sort of education that we give kids. The challenge always is to do it in a way that doesn't excite curiosity and uh, an experimentation. You know, if you, you go in there sort of saying you should stay away from this stuff, it's only for grown-ups and adults, then kids are in a big, big hurry to become grown-ups and adults uh, uh, attuned to this sort of thing and, and want to get in, involved in it. So finding uh, credible ways of getting health messages across to 
school age kids, I think, is critical. Uh, I think also probably a better public health education campaigns to directed at adult users about some of the downsides uh, of use, particularly around dependence and the, the risks that people run if they've got a personal history of psychiatric disorder, uh, particularly a psychosis. I think that's the, the bigger worry. And I mean, there's still argument about whether it can, as it were, precipitate or cause a psychosis. But I think the evidence is pretty clear that if you've got a, a history of psychosis and you get involved, particularly in heavy cannabis use, you have a much poorer outcome. You struggle uh, to deal with your illness and, and you're much more likely to be hospitalized more frequently and so on. When we talk about the adverse effects and similar things like you mentioned with psychosis, um, is that a specific disorder or something, or is it just something set up in someone's genetic system that they're able to detect that they just do not react well with cannabis? Because I'm one of those people, but it seems like if I blame my ADHD, I know plenty of people that use cannabis to medicate their ADHD or help it out and at least dumb down the symptoms a little bit. So I can't say that it's just ADHD people. No. Oh, look, I mean, these are all argument. These are all issues that people argue about. Um, I think the, I mean, psychosis is a, a fairly broad umbrella term for a, a group of disorders or illnesses rather than a single one. I mean, we, we've often talked about schizophrenia as though it's a thing, but it's uh, you know a group of symptoms of people develop uh, delusions that you know people are trying to harm them. Um, they they might hear things and voices speaking to them. They might struggle to focus their uh, attention on various things they struggle with school they find it difficult to engage socially with their peers and so on uh, so it's a, often a loose set of symptoms that has its onset around the sort of late teens and into the early 20s which is exactly the time that a lot of people get involved with first with cannabis and particularly with regular cannabis use so that combination of that sort of you know difficulty coping with the, the the everyday demands of uh, of life because of those sorts of problems that I've described, you sort of throw uh, heavy cannabis use into the mix, then often you make a bad situation considerably worse. Have you had a number of people step out and share, I guess, different opinions with the massive amount of legalization that has happened over just the past couple of years? I mean, when it comes to just talking about like I have a friend who's 35, smokes probably three, four times a day. When I actually get to have a real conversation with him, he'll be like, I feel like my life's on freeze and everything has kind of just gone away. And I know memory gets affected by marijuana, but I, for me, it just seemed like, yeah, it was just a way to, it, it does, it changes you in this. It, when you smoke it, it does something to you. It just makes you happier, makes you a little bit care less, or you lose track of your plans or something like that. And next thing you know, it could be 10, 15 years later and you're, on the wrong track. Yeah, look, I, th I think that's that's a fairly common, uh, um, well, not a common, I mean, it, it can be an outcome, particularly in young men. Uh, the, the New Zealand work that was done, you know, 20 odd years ago, sort of following uh, uh, over a thousand young people from uh, adolescence through into their sort of mid-adult mid, mid -adult life into their mid-30s. There was a substantial proportion of people who got involved in cannabis use in their teens who became daily users who used throughout the teens and into their 20s, who often missed out on forming relationships. So they are more likely to be men, so they didn't get involved with partners, either female or male. They often didn't finish school, so they didn't have qualifications. They struggled to uh, get reasonable jobs. They often had to live on welfare. And they they had lives, they, you know, they reported that they weren't especially happy with their lives. And as I remember commenting on, on one of the studies that was published that one of the things about cannabis use, particularly daily, is it enables people to cope with pretty uh, boring, uh, not very rewarding lives. It makes makes them tolerable, uh, and but it also makes it harder for people to break out of that, uh, to get involved in you know, in sort of more productive and rewarding uh, aspects of their lives to fully develop their potential and their skills. Has it? Any evidence changed on showing that it's a gateway drug now? I know before people said it couldn't lead you to other things, but I would feel like eventually if you're stim giving a stimulant to yourself like that in a sense and it doesn't work, then you would eventually just lead on to something heavier, stronger. Look, well, I think you know, that, that's a debated issue. I mean, I think there's no question that heavy cannabis users and regular and particularly daily cannabis users are much, much more likely than non-daily users to have used a variety of other drugs. 
Now, what explains that association people argue about? I mean, I think a substantial part of it is what's called common risk. You know, if you if you get involved with regular use of cannabis, you're almost certainly a regular cigarette smoker. You've probably been a heavy drinker. You're someone who likes the effects of different drugs, so it's not surprising. Uh, also, until recently, when, the, when cannabis was illegal, if you wanted to purchase the drug, then you were operating exactly the same illicit drug markets that were selling other drugs. So your opportunities to use drugs other than cannabis were were increased. And often you tended to spend most of your time in a peer group with people who are other drug users who are pretty tolerant of a variety of drugs, uh, of the use of different drugs. So I think those sorts of things are, explain the strong association, particularly between daily use of cannabis and the use of a variety of other illicit drugs, whether it's a gateway yeah, or a, you know, a shared uh, liability, as it's often put, a liability that, you know, it's a combination of a genetic susceptibility to develop dependence on a variety of drugs and probably, you know, to affiliate with a bunch of other people who like doing drugs. Um, Do we have any genetic markers to be able to tell what would be a genetic disposal for or propensity for some certain types of adverse effects or maybe something of that sort? Like, are you able to tell, like I, we mentioned earlier about, we don't, it could be a case by case basis when it comes to different psychiatric disorders, but uh, can we get technology good enough to a point to be able to check if it's a DNA structure, like this person just can't have cannabis at all? No, there's, well, there's, there's certainly been a lot of research exploring that possibility. Um, but I, I don't think we've, we've identified uh, lots of specific genes that, you know, tell you that somebody's at very high risk of, developing psychosis or dependence or these other adverse effects but that's true for not just for cannabis dependence it's proved true for alcohol and and tobacco and other things as well and that's been one of the puzzles of the the research on the human genome that it's it's very clear from the studies that there's a substantial genetic contribution to uh, the likelihood of developing various forms of drug dependence but the researchers have really struggled to identify individual genes that explain that association and the same has, has been true for cannabis. Now, are you able to check through a list of surveys, which I guess maybe if there's different rates, depending on what absorption that they use, if they use an edible, if they use smoking it, if they use a suppository or any of those sorts, does it affect the, any studies that you guys do? No. Well, I mean, part of the problem is a lot of these products are re reasonably new. You know, they've been around for maybe 10 years and we, we haven't had enough time or enough uh, research studies to look at the risks of different routes of administration. So in most of what we know about the risks of dependence, for example, uh, really comes down to the frequency of use. So it's the daily, near daily use pattern that's the highest risk factor for developing dependence. It's quite likely, given what we know about other drugs like alcohol and nicotine, that the use of more potent forms of cannabis, particularly with those with much higher THC content, and methods of delivery that deliver a larger dose quickly, such as vaping or um, uh, you know, sort of chasing, using wax uh, and, and other products of that sort are quite likely to increase the risk of dependence as well. But we don't have direct evidence that, uh, of that at the moment. I don't know what your opinion is on wax, but that should be 100% illegal. Uh, I don't agree with that drug being legal at all. That's a lot like salvia to me, at least when I took it, because when I hit wax, that it threw me into something. I, I was like, there's no normal person should be able to function like that. I just, I know it's stronger and it's more potent, but to the level of like, you have to heat up a torch and do all that. Just, I don't know. That seems and he puts you in a really bad spot. Well, that's certainly, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people uh, have, have said critics of legalization have said when we voted for the legalization of cannabis, we didn't imagine we were legalizing, uh, these extracts and waxes, we thought we were legalizing herbal cannabis, which of course was, was the way in which cannabis was used. So I think there's there's a big debate to be had uh, as to you know, how best to regulate these much more potent products. Uh, Quebec, for example, in, in Canada has banned their sale, as has Uruguay, which legalized uh, cannabis before the US. Um, that's sort of one potential option. I guess the unknowns there are the extent to which an illicit market will develop to meet the demand that people might have for these products. 
given that people know they can be produced. The, the other options, are, of course, are to tax these products much more steeply so that they're more expensive. And so if you want to purchase these, you've got to pay a lot more money. That's the, been the traditional way, for example, with alcohol that we tax uh, higher alcohol beverages at a higher rate than we do beer. So there's a variety of ways that one could think about uh, minimising the risk of these high potency products. Um, um, but that's sort of a conversation and the, the cannabis industry is, is fairly resistant to any of these sorts of proposals, particularly in the US. Is the law lagging behind the legalization at the speed that it's moving? Because like I, I have friends and I came across your study about this, but it was about driving on with cannabis. Um, when you know when you're using cannabis and driving, does it affect your driving? I have friends that say, "Oh, I drive way better when I'm on cannabis." And I know in some places they do driving while under the influence, um, depending on what your state you're on over here. Uh, they'll get you if you're on if you'll give you a ticket or something if you're high and driving which I think is not relatively new, but it's not that heard of. Um, I'm just curious if you think the law is a little bit lagging behind the massive amount of legalization that is happening in such a short period of time. Well, I think there's challenges around how you enforce laws against driving while intoxicated uh, after using cannabis. It's not as straightforward as it is with alcohol. I mean, we're lucky with alcohol that a, a breath test will, will be a, a very good indicator of your likely level of intoxication. We don't have a similar equivalent when it comes to cannabis. They check they your spit, right? Whether, yeah, well, they can tell whether you've used it recently, but the uh, the argument often is uh, whether it's enough to impair you, whether you're impaired as a consequence of your cannabis. Uh, and, and that's where the, the argument is to be had. In Australia, we've just basically, uh, by law, defined it as you know, having a a, a level of uh, THC in the blood above a certain low level is, by definition, cannabis impaired driving. There's a lot of criticism of that as, as a policy. Um, and it's it's also been introduced in some uh, countries in Europe. It hasn't, so far as I know, been introduced in the US because I think the state uh, authorities there still have to demonstrate that a person was impaired uh, rather than just that they'd been using cannabis. Now, is Canada the leading country when it comes to as an example of maybe a good starter or template for looking at the legalization aspects of cannabis? Well, I think they've had the advantage that because they've done it nationally or federally, they've been able to standardize policy across all their provinces. The provinces can still have more strict policies than the federal policy, but it, it's, it's enabled the Canadians to do that in a way that hasn't happened in the U.S., because legalization in the US has, has occurred at the state level and different states have been doing it differently while it's still federally illegal. So there's there's been real challenges in how to implement legalization. So it's been done in a pretty piecemeal way in the US. Whereas I think the Canadians have attempted to introduce legalization in a way that's uh, more oriented towards protecting public health. So as I said earlier, they've banned brands They've uh, insisted on plain packaging. They're requiring um, uh, health warnings on, on cannabis products. Uh, and they're, I think they're still talking about it, um, uh, taxing cannabis products on the basis of their THC content. So there's, there's much more of a focus there on minimizing adverse effects. The unknown really is to what extent they'll be able to resist the pushback from the cannabis industry. Because the cannabis industry point out that if you regulate and tax these products too highly, it makes it hard for the legal industry to compete with the illegal industry. And uh, that's been a problem, particularly I know in some US states such as California, where the illegal market continues to operate in a, a fairly substantial way. So the, the challenge for legalization is that it, it has a variety of different goals and that they're not all compatible. So if your goal is to eliminate the black market, then you make cannabis as cheap and freely available as possible. Uh, if you're in, in the business of minimizing the adverse effects on public health, you want to make it more expensive, particularly more potent products. You don't want it to be too widely available, and you certainly want to protect uh, young people from initiating and getting into difficulty with it. So balancing those sorts of um, goals of, uh, of cannabis legalization, I think, is, is the challenge. I think on the whole, the Canadians have probably made a better fist of it than 
many U.S. states, but you know, that's a, a broad generalization. Some U.S. states have done better than others. Oregon legalized everything, which I do not agree with at all. That's insane, but we see how that's kind of turning out down there. I'm just curious, when it comes to the critics of the cannabis industry compared to the people involved in the cannabis industry, is there an equal platform out there that they can both have a discussion about similar concerns and issues? I've spoken to both sides, never together. It seems like I can't ever get that to work out, but speaking to them separately, they both have good points and good, strong understanding, but they're just not speaking to each other and they don't want to listen to the other side's opinion about either concerns or positives, which I think we need to have a healthy platform just in the public's understanding. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the political process should be doing a better job of ensuring that the different voices are heard. I think at the moment it's probably a bit harder for critics to be heard because if you do say, you know, if you do talk about adverse effects of cannabis you dismissed as uh, reefer madness which is a sort of trumpian trope that people use to shut down argument um reefer madness by the way uh, was it was not a movie made by the, the u.s government it was a, an exploitation movie that was made after the passage of the marijuana tax act not before it which is what lots of people believe so it wasn't responsible for the prohibition of cannabis when did it Europe. come out because you told me that you weren't that old i thought it was like in the 60s or something is it no no the late th- well it, it was made in 1938 oh i'm so sorry then <laughs> I didn't mean yeah. Yeah, it was released in 1939 it was keith stroop uh who started normal the national organization for the legalization of marijuana who uh found the film in an archive and re-released it and sent it around the college circuit in the 1970s, I think sort of from about 1975 onwards. So the the movie owes its popularity to Keith Stroop, who presented it as a, as a, a government propaganda film, which it certainly wasn't. Um, you know, so it's it, it's sort of one of the common misconceptions that, you know, marijuana was prohibited in the US because of this film. It had nothing to do with it. It was made after marijuana had been prohibited. Why? It was made with the intent made with the intention of exploiting the fact that marijuana was now illegal to show salacious films to people in uh, in, in the guise of educating them. Are you concerned about the way that corporates are handling the legalization and seem like they're only caring about making as much money as possible when it comes to pushing? Well, that's what business to... does. That's what business does. Uh, and, you know, and, and that was always a risk, and I think a lot of us made that point before cannabis was legalized. I mean, once it's made a legal commodity, particularly if it becomes legal federally in the US, then the promotion of cannabis has constitutional protection, commercial freedom of speech. So it's going to be much harder in the US to restrain the sort of promotional activities of the legal cannabis industry. Uh, and it will be much harder to stop them forming large conglomerates that you know, are national companies that operate right across the US and, um, and mass produce cannabis products at the lowest possible price. That's almost a, a certain outcome of national legalization. And that's just because that's the way the American capitalism you know, market works. Yeah, that's capitalism. Um, the the Canadians, I guess, have, have attempted to moderate it with, with some of the, the policies I've talked about earlier. And, and I guess other countries that have more of a tradition of public health oriented policies in around alcohol and tobacco might do something similar. But it, it's hard to foresee that not happening in the US uh, if uh, cannabis, uh, be, you know, say if it's removed from the Controlled Substances Act and, and it becomes just another drug that uh, can be promoted. But at the moment, the fact that it's illegal federally really restrains the commercialization uh, of cannabis, certainly nationally in the US, it less restrained at the state level, but uh, it, it certainly is restraining it. I've seen some evidence and studies from the U.S. about the adverse effect, effects of cannabis and some in Canada. But why is New Zealand kind of seems like where there's a lot more evidence to support? I know it's not just on the basis of your work. I mean, I watched some of your talks in, on um, some of the New Zealand conferences that were out there talking about it, but it seems like that's the only available sources I could really find when it came to videos and platforms. Now, I've had Ben Court on the show, if you know who he is. He's talked heavily about, um, which I agree with him in every aspect of like concerns about adverse effects, but his stuff doesn't even pop up when you search up like adverse effects studies US. It's just 
it's usually stuff from like New Zealand or another country, which I, I'm curious if that's just the way you guys think about it over there compared to the way we think about well, it. Well, I think it was a happy accident. New Zealand set up two birth cohorts in in the 1960s, meaning that they recruited a, everybody born in a particular year and took two cities in New Zealand, Christchurch and Dunedin. And they then followed those those birth cohorts into adulthood. And of course, one of the things they asked about was cannabis use, uh, along with alcohol, tobacco, and a whole variety of other things. And it and it, it happened that the those two birth cohorts were ones where you know eighty percent of the, the cohorts used cannabis at some point. And there, there was sort of something like I think about a third of them, a third of the males at least, who probably got involved in regular cannabis use. So it meant that they were in a unique position to look at well, what are the consequences of regular cannabis use in adolescence and young adulthood in, in later adult life. We had a similar study in, in Melbourne in Australia, and there are studies that was, were also being done in Germany and the Netherlands, uh, often showing similar sorts of results. A lot of these studies were not started originally with the intention of examining cannabis use. They're often started as studies of broad mental health and well-being, but they often asked about cannabis, and as a consequence, they were able to look more closely at the effects uh, that cannabis uh, had on mental health and other outcomes in, in young adults. Does it affect brain growth if a youth gets a hold of cannabis? Well, it's you know, one of the, the sort of big debates in the field. Um, but I think there's Good and bad news there. And I think certainly if young people get involved in daily patterns of cannabis use and persist in doing it, there's all sorts of impairments of their ability to function in school and to complete school and education and so on. It's just it's the, the bad news. The more positive news is if young people can be persuaded to stop and they do succeed in stopping, then there seems to be you know almost complete recovery. And there's some debate about whether there's residual effects or not. But Young people who have a history of daily use and who succeed in stopping often can catch up and 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 make up ground on what they'd lost as a consequence of long periods of regular cannabis use. Have you seen in the past couple of years people my age, maybe younger, that are having different views towards cannabis than maybe five, ten years ago? Well, I think one of the surprises um, from legalization in the U.S. has been the so far uh, the lack of uptake a regular uptake amongst young people um, in the US because most of the uptake has been amongst people already adults in their early 20s and 30s and, and also older adults, as I've mentioned. Uh, we see a similar thing in Australia where we haven't legalised and there's you know a lot of debate. Younger people now seem to be less likely to smoke tobacco, less likely to binge drink alcohol, much less likely to use cannabis. And there's all sorts of debates about why that is the case. Is it is there something about this particular generation? Have they looked at the bad example of the generations above them and said, oh, "We're not going to do that," uh, or have, you know, has there been a uh, an unintended you know, positive outcome of say anti-smoking campaigns that have made young people less interested in using not just tobacco but a variety of other drugs as well? Um, so there's, I think, there is something of a generational difference, certainly. You know, I'm a boomer. Most of my age group, a lot of us had a lot, lots of experience with uh, with cannabis and to some degree other illicit drugs, the psychedelics and some of the stimulants, because they were around at the time and there was a lot of social tolerance of the use of those drugs. And I think, gener the, you know, the, the generations, our kids and children of our, our kids seem to be a bit less likely to be interested in, in using all of those drugs uh, for reasons that... You know, people are still debating. I think with uh, my parents' generation, they kind of enforced not doing it. And then it seems like with my generation, they were so open about doing it that now, now their kids are just have no interest in it, which makes it bring evidence to that suppression aspect, like how we've done a complete 180. I'm wondering if we have, uh, I mean, the next couple of years, if they start to balance out between the positive and negative, and we start to find a middle ground here on cannabis, do you think that there'll be a lot more people consuming it as much as maybe right now? Or do you think people will kind of just leave it and it'll be like the people who've been smoking it or using it would probably continue using it and then people wouldn't be that interested in it? Well, certainly I, I read the cannabis business press and they have an interest in expanding the market uh, in, 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 in what they describe as destigmatizing 
cannabis. But I think there's still a lot of stigma around it. Um, the use of cannabis, there's a, and it was the same, you know, with the repeal of alcohol prohibition, there was a whole generation who grew up during prohibition who weren't exposed to alcohol, who didn't drink alcohol into their, you know, throughout much of their adult life. Uh, and so I think you know you can get these sorts of generations if people have grown up in a social environment where there's hostility to the use of a particular drug, and it's it's criminalised. Then you know it's often hard to change those sorts of attitudes, but it's it's often easier for industry to market to generations coming through if they find appealing ways of presenting their product as a particularly a wellness product, which is the way that the cannabis industry is marketing cannabis at the moment as you know as a health and wellness product um, we're seeing a very similar thing with psychedelic drugs as well they're sort of following the the uh, the the the, uh, the sort of play sheet of the medical cannabis industry with the legalization of psilocybin and mdma and so on how does that fall in the same category as medical cannabis i actually walked into a, a vape store which they sell everything cannabis whatever you want but they had little gummies that were mushrooms but it was like micro dosing these little gummies oh, yeah. and i was just like yeah. how is that legal that have to make me i had a panic attack looking at it. first of all it's just seeing seeing weed in a store is weird i'm used to seeing it in a ziploc bag in somebody's sock drawer not hanging up on the shelves in a nice glass jar yeah yeah look, i mean i think you know attitudes towards cannabis have softened and uh you know, there's been a lot of promotion of research on the medical benefits of psilocybin and MDMA. And I mean, there's some pretty serious research done there, you know, pointing to there being benefits. Uh, I think it's probably still a bit early to be um, releasing it into the wild and promoting it broadly. But I think as a consequence of, you know, lots of positive uh, media stories about the benefits of, of psychedelics for mental health, um, and the moves in various U.S. states and cities to decriminalise personal possession and, and use, we'll see a lot more uh, people using it. Um, you know, it, it's not surprising if you've you've got a wholly positive media saying this stuff is wonderful for your mental health. If you're depressed or anxious, you know, try these things that will transform your life and uh, change you forever. Um, not surprising, a lot of people who might be anxious and depressed are prepared to give these drugs a try. They say the same thing about Reiki energy healing, but I'm still not having anybody put their hands on me. That's just, don't, don't get angry with that. But I'm curious to your perspective from the beginning to where you're at now of just doing this style of research and looking into these this topic, has it changed at all? Do you find yourself teetering back and forth on certain things? Have you had different perspective change on certain areas like um a certain usage of it for personal reasons or medical reasons? Uh, I mean, you're always surprised. I mean, I think what one of the things that's, you know, one of the consequences of legalization is it'll be a lot easier to do research on the, the health effects and benefits of cannabis. Um, so it's an interesting time to be doing research. And I've just retired, so it, it's something my students will be doing rather than me. Um, I'm sure there'll be surprises there. I mean, one of the surprises, uh, I think, has been the development or the identification of what's called the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, where very heavy uh, cannabis smokers turn up in emergency departments with projectile vomiting. Um, and that's been identified, I think, pretty clearly as a, as a you know, not a very common, but a, an a adverse effect of very heavy cannabis use that's been identified not just in the US and Canada, but also in Australia and in Europe as well. We know it's the, I mean, the evidence points to it being the cannabis because when people stop using the cannabis, these symptoms improve. And if they go back to using it, these symptoms recur. Uh, and it's a surprise because, you know, everybody thinks that cannabis is used to uh, stop nausea and vomiting. And here, you know, heavy use seems to be producing this bizarre uh, syndrome that has been identified. But it's not a common consequence, uh, but for some, you know, very heavy users, it, it can be a, a pretty unsettling symptom that drives people into seeking medical care.
is that a poisoning effect from the cannabis like consuming too much like if you consume too al- too much alcohol the room can spin but i've smoked too much and i've puked before and i've actually heard stories from friends who've done the same thing but i, I always wondered what that was because people would just say oh you must have had too much which makes you think is it well we, we don't know i mean it's it's a bit of a mystery uh, i mean i think the syndrome's been identified but uh, there's there's a lot of uncertainty as to what's driving it. You know what are, what are the mechanisms that produce this? Uh, it's certainly high doses appear to be something that's uh, involved. But why high doses of THC should produce projectile vomiting? That's not really clear at the moment. Does it, any of this lead up to what the I, I would call the myth is that you can't overdose on it? You can't experience a green out effect, but I'm curious if they're starting to look like there might be some evidence to show that there's people that could be severely, largely affected either permanently or have something like an overdose from just the content, the potency on these things are getting so ridiculous, which I have to feel like if you keep everyone's like a mad scientist, they're trying to double it down and with test tubes. So I'm like, yeah. Well, cannabis won't produ- won't produce the sort of overdoses you see if people use fentanyl or heroin, because it doesn't affect the the um, respiratory centres that control breathing in the same sort of way. But people can certainly get way too much and and end up uh, in an emergency department with really bad experiences, particularly high levels of anxiety, high heart rate, and this sort of projectile vomiting that I, I talked about, or you know becoming quite paranoid um, and experiencing psychotic symptoms. Those are the sorts of things we're seeing more of in emergency rooms in US states and more recently in Canada with legalization. And I think a lot of what's driving that is is people using these more potent products, particularly the edibles, because people find it often hard to uh, control or or, uh, regulate the dose they get of an edible. They often get much more than they bargain for and, and they have a pretty unpleasant experience. Well, I think with the uh, edible industry is this, it's a, it's just a weird relationship we have in society with food, which is that now people can put their THC or CBD in it. I mean, do you have different thoughts from THC compared to CBD? I mean, to me, I lump them kind of both in the same boat. I know CBD is more like you can get that at like a, a regular store compared to maybe going to a dispensary for THC, but I don't know. I don't see the same are the distinct difference between them well it's not cbd as people often say is not intoxicating in the way that thc is um i mean it's often it it makes people feel less anxious that's one of the more common reports and it has been shown to reduce uh, epileptic seizures in in children with some epileptic syndromes so there's there's potential therapeutic benefits for that uh, and it's been promoted more as a wellness product rather than as a product you use to get high. So I think that's the big difference between CBD and THC. Uh, I mean, the issue that's often raised is that the products, the, the cannabis that's been bred for recreational users, which high, is high in THC, often has very little CBD. And there's some question about whether that CBD tends to moderate the, the effects of the THC. So you're better off with using products that have some CBD in them as well as THC rather than just pure THC. Is there a limitation you can do designed by age? Like I hate to restrict it, but like you have to be 18 to smoke cigarettes, 21 to buy alcohol. I mean, I don't know what the gauge meter is to get cannabis, but obviously it's the youth's going to get a hold of it, hold of it if they're going to get a hold of it. But I see the targeting of advertising is what I'm concerned about or marketing. They're marketing it not just to elderly people, they're marketing it to the whole swath and like cake pops are designed for like, that would be younger youth. That's not, you know, elderly people wanting a cake pop. Well, in the US and uh, has adopted the same legal age of purchase for cannabis as for alcohol, which is 21. Uh, it varies a bit in Canada, I think depending on the province. I think the national recommendation is a purchase age of 18, which is the same for is for alcohol and I think tobacco. But some provinces, I think Quebec, uh, have, have made it 21. Um, I mean, there's there's two issues, whether you have a, a higher age of legal purchase and to what extent it's enforced. Uh, there's inevitably leakage. I mean, alcohol is technically illegal for anyone under the legal purchase age. We know that you know people, young people, can get hold of alcohol and tobacco uh, readily. But certainly a minimum legal purchase age and restricting where these products can be sold so that they're less accessible to 
young people would be fairly sensible policies um, to, to minimise that. It's much tougher to regulate promotion in ways that won't appeal to young people because stuff that's marketed to young adults is inevitably going to be appealing to uh, people under the legal age of purchase as well. Are you concerned as much as the corporates or are you concerned more in the focus of friends and people, family members sometimes, or just people that are using cannabis that would give it to their friend and experiment with their friend as well too? I know it's not everybody's friend, but I've been dosed with a 50 milligram edible and I don't handle cannabis well. And let me tell you something, that guy I got to talk into, um, but that happens. A lot of friends have horror stories of being dosed with a excessive amount of cannabis. Look, I think sensible public health education about cannabis as with alcohol would discourage people from forcing the drug on friends and for also being cautious about the doses, that it's not a good idea to be giving people larger doses than they might be expecting because people can have pretty unpleasant experiences. And I think that sort of message needs to be got out there. And it's, you know, the same is true of alcohol. I mean, if you're spiking people's drinks with with spirits um, you know, people can have pretty, they can get drunk very quickly and then have a pretty unpleasant time. And I, I think we should be discouraging that as, and discouraging people from forcing uh, high potency cannabis products on friends with, who are reluctant to use them. Sadly, I don't think people are going to want to ed educate themselves on some of this stuff. But do you think it's a problem that society will eventually correct itself, for instances, like jobs that would require you can't use cannabis if you're going to obviously we have certain instances, job careers already that you can't use cannabis, but it'll be become more of a, I guess, by location basis up to the owner's discretion of using cannabis um you can't use it within this amount of time you have to take a test or something like that i feel like this will eventually be a part of society much like how we have signs that say no smoking eventually society will catch up and try and correct that balance a little bit well i think we will see some pushback i mean if the industry uh, gets well ahead of itself and starts promoting cannabis in in unhealthy ways and there's adverse effects then they'll find themselves under more pressure from government and civil society to uh, moderate their promotion and to accept greater regulation of their products. Don't see a lot of sign of at the moment, I think more uh, sign of the industry pushing back on existing regulation and wanting to liberalise uh, so, that, so that they can compete with the illicit industry. How much of your research got intertwined with politics when it came to looking into this subject? It seems like from the people I've talked to, it's got some type of connection with politics a little bit. Well, it's hard not to be. I mean, it's an intensely political issue um, on both sides of, of the argument. Uh, I've always attempted to sort of separate, you know, the sort of broader social issues. And you know, I've always said very clearly that Cannabis policy involves a trade-off of various social uh, values, uh, you know, individual liberty, protecting public health, protecting young people, minimising crime and so on. And governments and elections are the, me the method that we usually use to make those sorts of trade-offs. But one would hope that in making those sorts of decisions that governments and civil society should be well informed about the, both the benefits and the risks of, of using cannabis and indeed other drugs and other behaviors such as gambling that uh, can cause social harm. I have to ask uh, this question to you, but it's about what are you what are your thoughts on pets using certain types of products with THC or CBD? That's not that's animal abuse, in my opinion. I mean, it might not be for some people, but I don't know, like how much more mellow can a cat get where you need to be <laughs> giving it THC or CBD? Well, people give their cats antidepressants. They submit them to all sorts of surgery. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think there are limits to what you, what you can do to stop people from doing that. Uh, and I think I'd encourage pet owners to be a bit a bit more sceptical about those sorts of health claims made for uh, the use of cannabis products in animals as they would people uh, being a bit more sceptical about the health claims made for cannabis products in in human beings. Yeah, I can't imagine someone giving their beta fish some cannabis and expecting it. Like I, th things are already pretty mellow, but okay. Is there one area that you would have liked to look into more about cannabis, whether if you had the time or the data for it? You mentioned a couple of things. Obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of controversial issues when it comes to the cannabis industry, but anything in your mind that you thought like maybe if you had more data or more time, you could have 
maybe went down this certain avenue? No, I think, I mean, I think I I had a, a good opportunity over the better part of 30 years to uh, really look at a, a lot of a lot of issues in this field. And it's been a you know a fascinating opportunity to to look at a variety of issues in, in different countries and so on. And I'm glad I, I'm out of, not out of it, but you know, I'm now a, a sort of more of a, an observer rather than a participant in the sorts of policy debates that are going on. And I can uh, hand on the responsibility for doing this work to students and others. Can I ask what your prediction would be for like say the next five years when it came when it comes to this whole cannabis subject? Do you think we'll find a balance with it or do you think people might reject it? I, I kind of see it going the other way again. Well, I think the difficulty once you've legalized an industry and you've created one, it's going to be hard to run that back. Uh, I think the you know, I think there's a a bit of a a sort of a an irresistible force. I mean, you've now got, I think, half of the US, half of Americans live in states where cannabis is legal. And I think the attractiveness of legalizing cannabis for lots of state governments is around revenue, raising tax revenue. That's often hard to resist, particularly when revenue is in short supply. There's a, a bit of a an international movement. We've now seen Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Malta, in Europe, all and the Spain as well, talking about legalizing cannabis. Uh, you've had Thailand do it, Mexico, Colombia. So it's it's. I think it's becoming pretty irresistible internationally, uh, and that's despite international treaties that most countries have signed, which will say that you're not allowed to do this. Um, so it's it, it's got a uh, a momentum behind it. I think that's going to be hard to reverse. Um, some, I mean, some countries may well hold out and wait to see what happens in in the early adopting countries. And insofar as they do, they might well be better placed to uh, regulate cannabis in ways that minimise some of the adverse effects of uh, legalisation under full commercialisation, at least. I wonder if Singapore will ever change their view on it. Yeah, they, I mean, I thought Thailand would have been a surprise because they were raging, waging a war on drugs and shooting drug users um, and drug dealers only 10 years ago. And they did a radical about face. Um, I mean, although there's, I gather there's talk of uh, pulling it back to uh, make it only medical uh, cannabis that's legal in Thailand. But I think you know, once you've let the genie out of the bottle, I think it's often hard to put it back in. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Well, Mr. Hall, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show. Is there a place where people can, do you have any links you'd like to promote, any social media handles, websites, articles? Uh, I sort of uh, abdicating from social media. I, I've got a, a granddaughter and lots of things that keep me busy these days. So I can't afford the luxury of spending lots of time on social media. There's a website uh, at the University of Queensland, which has got a list of my publications and there'd be links to various versions of those if people want to get them you know those that are behind paywalls um so it's it's possible to get hold of a lot of the stuff i've talked about tonight and i'll link some of your publications that i find and anything that we might have mentioned um in this chat in the description for people to be able to click it's been a pleasure chatting with you and thanks everybody for listening to this episode of out of the blank stay tuned for our next episode